Greetings, this is Ryan Roy from Liberty3D.com. Today I'll be covering the very basics of Deep Rising FX, a brand new fluid simulation plugin for Lightwave. While I don't consider Deep Rising a replacement for more advanced solutions like RealFlow or Houdini, it serves as a much more affordable alternative best suited to small to medium scale simulations. And as a bonus, the whole workflow stays within Lightwave. Since I'm fairly certain Deep Rising will change fairly quickly, I'm keeping this content very brief and sticking to the essentials. Just to make sure that we're on the same page, after successfully installing the plugin, you should have a Deep Effects tab or something similar up here that allows you access to the plugin's functions. If you don't have a Deep Effects tab, I've included a menu config file for your convenience. To use it, just visit the menu layout, right click main menu to import a branch, and then use the config file that I've bundled with this video. At this point, we're pretty much ready to go. Deep Rising consists of four buttons. The domain is essentially your main workspace where you will add fluids and determine what those fluids should collide with. The solvers window mainly determines how your fluids should behave and you can modify things like how fast it moves, how thick the fluid is, whether or not it sticks to surfaces, and so on. In almost all cases, you're going to want to have the preview simulation option enabled, so make sure you have that checked. Upon completing your simulations, the meshing window will let you turn your particles into a geometry mesh sequence. The fourth button here will let you start the simulation and process frames until it reaches the end of your current timeline end frame. With that information out of the way, let's go through the steps of putting together a simulation. In order to be able to generate, preview, or save any simulation we make, we must add a cache. To do that, we need to make a new null. The name of it doesn't matter, but I'll call it DeepFX Cache. Now we can go into the Edit menu and add the selected item as a cache. Everything in the cache options are pretty self-explanatory, but for now I'll leave everything at their default settings. The second thing we need is something that emits fluid, so I'll create another null and add this as an emitter. From here, the simulate button can be pressed and we get particles. The simulation will always use the current timeline range as the intended number of frames to process. There are a few things that you need to know regarding how emitters work. I do not find the defaults ideal for general use scenarios, and they certainly aren't optimized for quick previewing. The particle limit currently has a big impact on how efficiently things will simulate, so only use as many as you think are required. Furthermore, if your scene scale is adjusted properly, which I'll talk about in a later chapter, you can get away with making the circle radius smaller. The other parameters can be adjusted to your liking. Strength determining how fast the fluid is emitted, and randomness lets you avoid unwanted patterns in the stream. Okay, let's give these particles something to collide with. You can insert primitives directly into layout to do this, but what I'll do instead is create a bowl and modeler to catch these particles. The only major requirement Deep Rising has for geometry is that it must be tripled. So after making your collision object, visit the Multiply tab and hit Triple before saving it out and placing it into your scene. It's worth noting that neither the topology nor the density of the polygons matter much with collision objects in Deep Rising. It also does not matter which way the polygons are facing, all particles will collide with both sides of the polygon, so for the purposes of this demonstration, I'll just hit F to invert the faces of all the polygons so that we can see the fluid easier. Anyhow, this newly constructed mesh can now be added as a rigid object. Inside the rigid object options, the type determines whether or not Deep Rising sees this as a moving or non-moving object, or in other words, static and kinematic. Static objects, of course, will calculate much faster, as there's less to keep track of. 
If you observe during your simulations that particles are penetrating your object, the particle spacing can be lowered at the cost of simulation speed. Just note that whenever you adjust the setting or scale your object, you'll need to hit the Resample Mesh button in order to see the result of these changes. This is partly why I like to keep the Show Collision Particles option checked, so that I can see how Deep Rising interprets the Mesh Collision object. In addition to emitters, you can also generate a fluid object from geometry. To demonstrate this, let's get rid of the emitter object for right now. I'll add a sphere from the Modeler Tools tab and set this up in Deep Rising to be a fluid object. As of this video, this is kind of an experimental feature, so I strongly recommend that you always save before attempting to create or modify fluid objects. In this way, you can create pools of fluid or have a concentrated mass of particles all fall at once for a more dramatic splash effect. Although that's the basics of setting up and modifying deep rising particles, something you'll definitely notice is that the simulation feels like it's done in slow motion. In order to explain why this is happening, I have to explain time steps and substeps. Without getting needlessly complicated, here's the most basic explanation that I can possibly think of. Deep Rising's simulation is not based off the frames per second of your scene, but rather it uses its own internal separate timeline. The time step dictates how often particles are kept track of. So if I increase this to twice its normal value and re-simulate this, the simulation will play exactly two times faster. Also notice that in the same amount of time spent calculating the simulation for this time range, our fluid has traveled twice as far as it would have at its default setting. Okay then, let's see what happens when we make the time step 12 times faster. Not only has the fluid lost a lot of its detail, but now particles are passing through the bowl. It looks very sloppy and it plays back way too fast. The errors are happening because the particles aren't being checked often enough, so the simulator has trouble determining whether or not particles should be hitting something since there's such a large gap between checked frames. That said, I want you to look at time steps as the primary level of detail or accuracy setting rather than a means of speeding up or slowing down your simulation. The default value of 0.001 is good for most scenarios, but you may want to increase this value to boost the speed of your simulation so that you can kind of draft things out and preview your work more quickly. This brings us to substeps. In human language terms, this basically means how many time steps should be skipped before placing any particles into the light wave timeline. So, if I set the substeps to four times its normal value, the simulation will play four times faster in the light wave timeline. Increasing substeps will also increase the time it takes to calculate things, but this is only because Deep Rising is processing a greater quantity of its internal frames relative to your current timeline range. The takeaway here is that the time step is your detail or accuracy setting, while substeps control how fast your fluid simulation actually plays back. This brings up a question though. How can we possibly keep the speed of the fluid's playback consistent if both time steps and substeps affect it? Here is my suggestion to answer this question. Let's say that we're happy with how fast the fluid is actually moving, but we want to cut down simulation times. We can use LightWave's Field Math feature, which works on any field in LightWave, to make this happen. So I'll multiply the time step by 4 and then divide the substeps by that same number. This not only effectively decreases the computational burden by lowering simulation accuracy, but at the same time preserves the speed of the fluid exactly. Experimentation is so much easier when your simulations complete quickly. If we want to get more detail out of the simulation, we can just do the opposite. Divide the top number by 4 and multiply the substeps by the same number.
In the future, I would like for the fields to take care of this math for you, or present this information in a way that's less technical, but for now this is the way to alter the level of detail of the fluid while preserving the actual speed of it. As for the rest of the stuff found in solver options, these tabs below all determine how your fluid behaves, how thick it is, how prone it is to creating waves or swirls, whether the fluid will stick to collision objects, and the fluid's tendency to form larger droplets, tendrils, and thicker looking splashes. That pretty much covers the very basics of deep rising particles, so let us delve into the topic of taking a completed particle animation and turn it into a geometry mesh sequence that can be surfaced and rendered. As of this video, I actually consider Deep Rising's mesh tools to be rather lacking in certain areas, so what I'll be demonstrating involves some extra tools that I've made to help fill in the gaps and make things a little bit more manageable for you. Let us assume for the sake of this example that we have a particle animation that is ready to be meshed out. Before doing anything, we need to add a new null to the scene and assign it as a mesh reference. Upon opening the meshing window, notice that the reference item and cache fields are automatically populated for you. As long as these two items are present within the domain, all of these other options can be utilized. Most often you'll be moving your playhead to somewhere in the middle of your animation and hitting the preview mesh button. Without making any changes, the default settings leave quite a lot to be desired, so let's take a look at some options here. Currently the filters are the biggest contributors to the look of the fluid, but the way it's set up kind of makes experimentation a little difficult. To save you some time, I suggest Dilate, Median, Gaussian, and Erode as a workable starting point. In almost all cases, you will want to leave the meshing grid resolution, or the polygon density of the fluid, at its default. Don't let the scary math looking options here fool you. This basically translates to low, medium, or high. You can treat the particle radius and narrow band size as a means of expanding or contracting the fluid mesh. This is particularly useful if your fluid looks a little bit too blobby or too lumpy, or if large numbers of isolated particles are creating too much noise visually. To finalize tweaking the look of your fluid mesh, I highly recommend surfacing it at this point. If you open the surface editor, you'll notice that the null we created for the mesh reference is actually listed here, and it has a surface. Make all of the alterations that you like. When done, right click the mesh reference and save out a surface library as you'll need this later. Be absolutely certain to save this in the same directory where you intend to export the mesh frames. After doing all that, we can turn this fluid mesh into a completed fluid animation. First select the directory in which you want to save the processed frames, which again should be the same directory where you place the surface library file. Upon hitting the export mesh sequence button, Every frame in your timeline range will be processed and saved onto your hard drive. Now it is time to talk about actually using this processed mesh sequence. Generally, I like to keep the particle scenes separate from my production scenes in order to prevent unnecessary clutter, so at this point I'm just going to make a brand new scene. Deep Rising's current method for loading a mesh into the scene is a workflow that I cannot recommend at this time, as it requires you to create specific folders and specific objects. Previewing dense fluids in motion is also way too sluggish in Deep Rising's mesh sequencer, so instead, I'm going to show you how to do things my way. First create a null, and then hit P for properties to use the Deep Rising mesh sequencer, we want to point it to the mesh sequence that we recently created. Depending on your maturity level, you might find the file extension of Asbin quite amusing, so get your ass in gear and select any one of these Asbin files. This is where the first bit of scripting comes into play. Included in the same folder that you opened this video in, you'll notice a few .py files which you will need 
Install these like you would any other plugin. Just visit the Utilities tab, add them, and use the LightWave menus to insert them into the Deep Effects tool tab. The plugin we want to use is DR Mesh Convert. This takes the selected deep rising mesh sequence and converts each frame into a LightWave object file. The only thing the plugin asks for is a surface library. After choosing that, the plugin will convert each frame into a standard LightWave object file and save it into the same directory as the surface library file. When it's done, the deep rising object can be removed from the scene as it's no longer needed. You can now load in the first LightWave object file generated by the plugin and utilize LightWave's native object sequencer. This leaves us with a fluid mesh that plays back way more efficiently than if we used the deep rising sequencer. And we also gain the option to play with subpatch levels as well. With everything in place, the object the fluid is supposed to be interacting with can be loaded into the scene.